Great. Hello and welcome to Awkward Family Conversations, where we try to help millennials and Gen Z Zoomers uh, figure out life. Um, this is our season finale for season four. It's extremely exciting. Uh, if you have any ideas of themes for season five, we still haven't decided, so let us know. Um, as always, I'm here with my dad, who at the end of the summer is no longer going to be a California boy. Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. Mm -hmm. We'll have to see how it goes. But you're right. I could be living somewhere else by the end of the summer. That's true. Yeah, very it's good. Very exciting. He's stuck at least through the end of the summer. But uh, it's never stuck is a strong word to use. I mean, being in California is no hardship, to be sure. He's committed through at least the end of the summer. <laughs> there we go. Yes, indeed. Yes. Hi, Ed. I'm joined with, uh, as always, with uh, my younger daughter, Eddie. And uh, Eddie had a momentous uh, week. Uh, she was with us in California last week, went back to her home in Nashville and uh, has decided for health reasons again to go back to a gluten-free diet. Mm -hmm. And uh, we we're talking before we started the recording, we were talking about the transitions uh, that that means for her and all of the things that uh has to change have, have to change for her for that so she's uh, embarking on her own transition that's yeah. probably not as significant as the transition we're going to talk today but it's still important and it's still i mean it's a factor <laughs> it's relevant it's a way sure. to, to put that off a little bit <laughs> yeah to be sure so hello ed what are we going to talk about today to close out our season four of our season of transitions we are closing out our season four with arguably um, the biggest transition, the final transition, the transition between being alive and being dead. Um, so what's the big deal about death and dying? Yeah, what is the big deal about death and dying? It uh, consumes a tremendous part of our psyche. Um, mm -hmm. All you got to do is look at our art and you will see that death figures prominently in our consciousness. Which is interesting because, of course, this is, I think, for me, it's an interesting transition because, yes, the transition from being to not being is, every, you know, it's massive. It's, a, it's, it's the biggest transition there is. <laughs> um, and yet, uh, where all the other transitions that we've talked about, these transitions, these stages of life that we go through, leaving home, you know, finding work. Uh, finding partners, leaving partners, um, all of those things. Um, a lot of the a lot of the struggle with the transition is the aftermath. What uh, you know? How do you adjust to a new a new a new reality, a new way of being? Um, but this one, when the transition happens, I mean, depending on your faith no, or what you believe, <laughs> you know, it you, you cease to exist. Uh, you know, there is no aftermath, there is nothing to adjust to. So all of the adjustment, all of the anxiety and angst and, and thought all happens before the transition occurs. And of course, that's true for most transitions, but there's always the afterward adjustment. And that's not going to be the case with, uh, with death and dying. So in that sense, it's a it's a bit of a different a bit it's of definitely a different thing. more of a it's a transition for the people around you more than it is a transition for or like, you know, afterwards, <laughs> it's less of a transition for you. Like, I've never really been that afraid of death itself because. Because you're 23. <laughs> no, honestly, I've, I've had some very close run-ins with my own mortality. Yeah. Um, and especially yeah. being disabled, it's something that I've confronted. And the life expectancy for celiacs is about 60 years. Um, so I've have come, I've dealt with a lot of my own mortality and recognizing that I'm probably going to die before most of my peers um, and I'm not really afraid of the actual act of death. What I am afraid of is dying. Yeah. I want to be easy. I don't want to go out painfully. That sounds scary, but I'm definitely, I'm not really that afraid of what comes next because what you got to do, avoid it. Well, that's, yes. I mean, that's the thing, right? I mean, death is the, you know, the, the old saying, there's two things in life that are certain death and taxes and uh, death is always 
it figures prominently even in our jokes um and you're right it's uh you know the thought of death is uh anxiety producing there are cultures that won't deal with death they won't talk about it um either for superstition or just fear so you have all this i mean there's the personal angst right i mean we're we're alive and like every living being there's kind of a an imperative that we survive um you know that's a uh you know there's a trying to avoid death is a very strong very strong drive for all living things um we we exist and we are and we want to continue to to be and uh you know death is the end of that and so confronting that and thinking about it is really really challenging and it's unusual for somebody as young as you are and and, and I understand what you're saying because you're right. You do have a bunch of conditions, um, you know, that that can be, um, you know, that, that that can can result in a shortened lifespan, faster death, um, you know. And but the reality is, we all face death every day. Um, I'm going to a service this afternoon for a friend of ours who lost their son at 19 um, to a very fast and severe illness and, uh, you know, heartbreaking, um, freshman in college and, and by all accounts, healthy and all expectations would be that, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd have a long productive, happy life, but, uh, but it didn't, wasn't to be. So, you know, people, people die every day of accidents, of illnesses, um, sudden, sudden things that happen. And so, we're fooling ourselves a little bit when we think, oh, death is a long way away, or um, I don't want to have to think about death uh, because it's uncomfortable. And uh, But the reality is, is that it, it does happen, whether you think about it or not. <laughs> and thinking about it, we're back to kind of being intentional, right? Uh, which is one of, the, one of our watchwords here on Awkward Family Conversations is uh, be intentional. Um, you know, thinking about death and preparing yourself emotionally, mentally, even physically, uh, for the possibility is, um, you know, it's important because it's because because I think what you said earlier about the, the people you leave behind when you die, they have to deal. It's a transition for them, too. And they have to deal with the emotional fallout. And the- that was uh, weirdly enough. I I don't think I ever told you about this. So you're learning about it on live. It's very exciting. Um, I went through a time sophomore year of college where I was suicidal and there was one night where I almost did it um, because I had all the meds and everything that I was going to take and I was like I don't want to make my mom cry that's I don't want to do that I don't want to make my mom cry and that was what got me through it and I didn't do it and then that was kind of my rock bottom and the next day I was like zoinks let's not do that again yeah Um, glad I didn't do that yeah yeah, started talking to my therapist more candidly about that at that time. Yeah. Um, and got, I, you know, fixed it and I haven't been in that situation. But every September it comes back around and it's kind of like, yeah, that was that was a place that I was. And it was it was dangerous and it was bad. Um, but it was it was that motivation of the people around me. I didn't want to leave them in pain. That was unnecessary. And I'm real glad I didn't. Even sometimes, I think last September was probably the first time that my life felt bad since then because like every September I kind of go through a thing of like man I'm glad I didn't do that because look where I am now and last year I was really sick and having a really hard time in September and it was kind of hard to be like glad I didn't do that because look where I am now because didn't feel that much better but it was still like glad I didn't do it anyway just rather would be alive (laughs) yeah well uh sophomore year of college is tough I had a similar experience sophomore year of college uh mine was in october fall nice. break so i and, got it uh, you. <laughs> well i i actually did attempt it actually oh. and uh with my best friend standing there so it wouldn't consider it a serious attempt but uh yeah i mean i think these are i mean that happens to coincide with some of the other life transitions right i mean sophomore year of college is tough i mean the freshman year is full of excitement and it's new and you go home for the summer and then you come back and it's kind of like, it just, I, it's very, I mean, you know, your, your cousin, Andrew uh, took a year off of school, his sophomore year, what would have been his sophomore year of college, went back to school, finished his degree, but he was also, uh, I think that's a, that's not an uncommon experience to feel dislocated, um, to take 
to make an attempt on your life or to seriously consider uh, taking your life, of course, is a, is a far more extreme yeah. um, situation. And yet, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, suicide is a very, very hard, very, very important, very um, significant issue for, for young people, uh, teenagers, young, young adults. Um, you know, there's a lot of stress in this transition from learning to being from, from, you know, depending and having a family support structure around you and then moving to more independence when maybe you don't feel as confident or as strong. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it, it leads to dark places sometimes. And then you have experiences that you're not familiar with. For me, the trigger was the, you know, the, the end of my first real romantic relationship. And, uh, you know, I, it, it felt lonely and my friends didn't, who had all been through it and realized it's really not that big of a deal that it's a common life experience, but it was the first time I'd had to deal with that kind of rejection and that confusion. And then I, not to have feel the support of, um, you know, the friends that I had left me feeling very vulnerable and very upset. And, uh, you know, my suicide attempt was really a cry for help to basically say, Hey, look at me, I'm in pain. Nobody's nobody's paying attention to me and nobody's recognizing the fact that I'm hurting here and yeah. I need to do something drastic to kind of get that attention. So oh, mine wasn't, because, yeah, mine wasn't really about ending my, yeah. my life. It was about letting people know that I, I am. mean, I would go so far to say that all suicide attempts, even if they work are a cry for help either to yourself yeah. or to other people. And for me, it was, I was alone when I was going to do it. Um, but I recognized afterwards that like, this is real. This is something I need to talk to my therapist about. Like I, I need help with this. This is not something I can handle on my own because handling on my own looks like a bottle of pills on my nightstand. And that's not good. That's yeah. not what I want. Yeah. Um, and I have some friends and friends of friends who have died by suicide. And every mm -hmm. time it is like a, there either wasn't help or they weren't able to get it. Um, and they felt like they had no choice and that was what it was you know nobody dies by suicide in like a accidental way well yeah, exactly it's a conscious choice to end suffering uh, yeah. i think and um whether it's a cry for help like in my case or just a way a way out because you just can't see living any longer with whatever pain you're you're suffering from um but you know, there's the, there is a saying that, uh, you know, suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And that's a little mm -hmm. bit flip, but accurate nonetheless. I mean, you know, when you live and especially as you build life experiences, you learn that pain does not go away necessarily, but it does lessen with, with more experiences and you can find joy after the greatest sorrow in the world. Um, One of the things you know, I like about, um, being raised Wiccan by mom <laughs> there's a concept in Wicca about the rhythm of the universe mm -hmm. um and sometimes your own rhythm gets out of sync with it mm -hmm. and when that happens that's when it feels like everything's just kicking you while you're down and at this point in my life I've gone through enough of those to know that like it is temporary just focus on getting yourself in order and keeping yourself alive and you'll find you'll get back in rhythm yeah. and it'll happen again like you'll go through the good period. And when the good period is happening, you know that a bad period is coming, but yeah. you also know that there's more good after it. Um, and that's been, that has been a principle that's really helped me throughout my life is understanding that like this ends, it always ends. Everything is temporary. Yeah. Um, no matter how long it takes, it always ends. Yeah. I think one of the really important campaigns in that order where the uh, is for gay youth where the whole it get, it gets better you know when you're 13 14 15 dealing with um you know sexuality that falls out kind of falls outside sort of the societal norms or expectations of the mainstream society it's it's hard i mean it's hard to feel alone anyway but especially when you're a, a, an adolescent and this is your first experience with it and you're being rejected and people are making judgments about you that aren't fair um it, and, and fairness is a really important thing for children and adolescents, um, you know, but, but just to hear, Hey, look, it, it does get better. It sucks right now, but it will get better. And I think that's a really important message for people who are young, who don't have the life experiences that would tell them you can survive this. And if you get through this, 
it will get better and you will, you can find happiness. Um, you know, you have a cousin that has struggled for, you know, basically her whole life with all kinds of crap. And much of it is not of her own making. It's a lot of it is just is circumstance. And she's been dealt a very bad hand and she's played it badly at times. Um, you know, but, you know, with all the stuff she's had to deal with, um, you know, there's a core, there's something inside her that just won't let her give up. Um, you know, she's incredibly how strong and resilient are words that are kind of thrown around a lot. But, um, you know, for her, I think it's, it's really remarkable to me that somebody's had to deal with as much stuff. And some of it is, again, is self-inflicted and there's no question about it, but to recognize that she is worthy in some level and she's not going to give up. And I think, uh, or she hasn't given up yet anyway. And, you know, I hope she continues to fight the good fight, um, despite the fact that she's got all these challenges, um, uh, that life has kind of kind of left her. And, uh, you know, she could, she, there are many points and, and sometimes where she was very close to taking that, uh, taking that exit ramp, but, um, you know, something has always kept her from doing that. And uh, I think it's that sense that there's something better ahead, you know, that, that she can make a better life for herself. And it's hard. It, and it gets harder kind of the older you get, you, you miss opportunities to learn, you know, you miss opportunities to be in a protected, supportive environment, you know, when you get out on your own, you know, you don't have the luxury, you have to support yourself in some way, shape or form. And you don't have the luxury of a family that will earn the money so that you can do the things. So you don't have to earn the money. So you can focus on, on other things, you know, as you get older and you have to earn the money, you have to, you know, um, provide for yourself, um, maybe a family too. It, I think it, that's it, one it, of the interesting things too, is that that's a very like, western european kind of cultures a lot of other cultures are like you go to college you go do whatever it is you do for your education and then you come back home until you're mm -hmm. married like there's always mm -hmm. a community around you're never on your own in a lot of other cultures and i think that's one of the biggest ways that we as like you know western for lack of a better word yeah. culture does wrong by our young people is like when you get you get kicked out of the nest and then you're flailing um, and it's really really hard to find community to support yourself because humans aren't we aren't solitary creatures we are communal creatures we mm -hmm. need community and we need groups of people and it's very difficult to be one person on your own trying to make everything work um, which is why I think like the roommates relationship too is such a powerful one because mm -hmm that is your community. You're all mm -hmm. working together. Yeah. Um, and I, when I was going through that time where I was suicidal, I was living with four other girls in a small apartment. And that was really what turned it around for me was having, being able to walk out of my door and have my four best friends right there, always there. Mm -hmm. um, I was never really alone in my apartment. And then it was like, that really was what turned it around and kept me in college because I was about to drop out too. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. we're not coming back for spring semester. I'm done with this. Right. Um, but they they were the ones who really turned it around for me because it was like there are people out there who care about you and want to uplift you and you don't have to do everything on your own. Um, and that everything on your own is is really, really difficult. And honestly just it's too much to expect from anybody at any age. Um, yes and no. I mean, you know, the 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 conflict the it's and it's a, it's an essential conflict in, in human nature is the independence versus community um you know in those cultures you mentioned uh where you, you know you kind of leave and you come back and your family uh you give up a lot of you give up a lot of discretion you know there's the patriarch who makes the decisions for the family and mm -hmm. you know if you don't follow that direction then no and I, I wouldn't say you know. that cultures that do have that kind of sense of community are perfect in all ways too no, there's no, plenty no. of misogyny and transphobia and homophobia that goes on um in cultures mm -hmm. where kids aren't allowed to experience being a kid adult yeah um, but the but, but yeah my, I, I think that there's a happy medium in between of course, but striking the balance is almost impossible, right? But my point isn't about the, you know, the, the rejection of alternative cultures and non-normative sort of behaviors. It's really about giving up discretion and, and autonomy. And when you come back to a family like this, um, and I saw this in, when I was working at, uh, at Schwab, I worked with the Asia Pacific group, and it was 
um, an organization dominated by uh, folks that uh, uh, came out of Hong Kong. And um, it, it was set up like a family. They weren't related, but it was set up like a family. And in talking, you know, I worked with them for three years and in talking with them, I understood from their perspective, I mean, there's a lot of positives to be said for that family structure, right? And your role is well-defined. You have a group of people and you're all working toward the same goal, but you have to give up control of your own destiny. You can't choose what your role is. That's assigned to you. And you need to come to peace with that to be a, to be a part of the family or the community around, uh, around you. So, you, uh, you know, I'm just, I agree with you that there is a, you know, that, that kicking people out of the nest works for some people. And it doesn't work for an awful lot of people. Um, but by the same token, that family, culture, community means sacrifice as well. And the sacrifice you make to be a part of that community is oftentimes lack of control over your own destiny. You, you have to take the role that's assigned to you or you have to leave. And this was a lot of, you know, the America really remember was founded, not entirely founded, that's the wrong thing, but many, many, many immigrants that came to the U.S., uh, came because they chafed. Um, they chafed because of societal norms, religious, uh, you know, you got the Puritans who were treated very badly. So they left, came to the U S. Um, so they could treat other people worse. Well, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, yeah exactly. Cause everybody wants power, right? That's another piece of human uh, thing. I want things my way and yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to seek power to make sure that I can, can have things my way. But, uh, we're getting pretty far away from death and dying here, but this is this, this, this tension in, in us, is we want to be part of a community, but we also want to kind of control our own destiny. And those things are not often, or those things are often, if not in conflict, um, you know, they, they, they are at cross purposes because you want to control things and you want to be part of a team. And this is maybe the, why, you, why you seek power so you can have that. So you can have the community, but also make things your way. And uh, interesting. But yeah. back to the back to the death and dying, unless there's say, that's a, it's a good segue, um, the power of destiny in that. And I really spoiler alert for the good place. Um, the ultimate conclusion of the show. And I, I really liked that show. It um, was a great show. I love the good fantastic place. show. The ultimate conclusion is death is what gives life meaning. The fact mm -hmm. that it ends is what makes it meaningful. Um, yeah. And I think that's kind of where like the power of like destiny comes in is yeah. the concept of like, what do I get to do with this time only matters because we have a limited amount of time. Um, and every choice you make is affects how much time or what, how much time you have to do whatever it is that you choose to do. Exactly. Um, and there's like sacrifice is a really important part of that, but so is listening to yourself and being your mm -hmm. own person. But that, mm -hmm. that really, that show really kind of put my own opinion of mortality um, into focus. Yeah. It's just like the, what is it that matters to me? What is it that I want to do? And like, while life is short, it's also the longest thing you'll ever do. <laughs> well, it's the, the yeah it's the entirety of what you will do right yeah um, it is, it's the longest thing but also it's, it's not that long it goes by fast yeah no you're right yeah. you're right no I, and i think that uh yeah you're absolutely right i mean we all want to be remembered um you know another movie well another media thing that i found very profound or it, it affected me profoundly was the movie coco um where you even when you die um as long as people remember you, you, you still exist. Mm -hmm. But when the last person who remembers you dies, then you truly go away yeah. and, and you're forgotten. And uh, your grandfather, Papa has talked about that with me a few different times is mm -hmm. you die twice, once when you die and once when the last person who remembers you dies, um, because once that happens, no, you're, you're forgotten. And uh, we strive I think there's certainly something elemental, uh, essential part of, of us as people is we don't want to be forgotten. We, you know, our lives. Um, there was a book I read, Permission to Curse, if it's the name of a book. Mm, okay. If it's, if, if it's in quotes, yes. Okay. I'll just say it the one time, but the book is called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Um, and it's a self-help book, which is not really my favorite genre. Um, mm -hmm. because I find that a lot of it is pull up your own bootstraps, which is not helpful advice. Um, but this book talked a lot about how we're all 
told from a young age that like we want to be extraordinary and I remember hearing that quote when I was young and it was like you better be remembered because your life only matters if people remember you and the whole point of this book was basically we're not all going to be extraordinary some of us are going to be forgotten quickly does it matter you don't know that you've been forgotten right you've already lived and died so live how you want to and make your little life mean something to you. And I've really liked that because I've never been particularly like, I need to leave my mark on the world in a big way. Um, Cause that's just, I don't want that attention. That's very scary. (laughs) Um, But I also like, I, that book really changed a lot of my perspective on my life too, because I like the idea of living my little life. Like I don't, I want a little life, but I want it to mean something to me. I want it to be the life that I want to live. Um, And I don't really care if I have kids and they remember me for a long time or if I like leave a lasting impression. If I've made an impression on the people who are around me in my lifetime that matter to me and it's an impression that I'm proud of, then I'm satisfied. That's that is enough for me. And that the point of this book was basically like that should be enough for all of us is embracing the fact that like if we're all extraordinary, if we're all striving to do something huge, then nobody will succeed none of us are extraordinary if we all are so be ordinary thrive in being ordinary and i like that i like that principle a lot yeah i think it's yeah yeah, that's another essential conflict in us right i mean accept what your life will be i mean extraordinary people are like you say extraordinary means they're they're an outlier (laughs) Um, everybody can't be an outlier well often the people that we think of as extraordinary are people who have had different types of advantages and look a certain way or had a type background. Um, and there's, there's many people who aren't, right. but yeah. who don't fit that mold. I'm not speaking that every single person we know who's a historical figure, but like, there's a reason why most celebrities are skinny white people. Mm-hmm. Um, and the people who are remembered for a long time are rich white people because that's, who's telling our history. Um, And so I liked the point of this book because it was kind of like, you don't have to be remembered by everybody. You just have to be remembered by the people that matter. Um, And and I I like that better because the reaching everybody, the way that our society exists now is reserved for a select type of person. Um, And there's, there are outliers who break through for sure. But the fact of the matter is the artists who defined our culture and what we call literature and what we call high art culture, et cetera, is defined by white people out here. Um, And that's, I don't, I don't think that that's like a super great measure of whether or not you're extraordinary. I wouldn't, I I, I don't disagree with the statement, the last statement that that's not the measure, but I do disagree that it's, I think what you've seen. So I believe that every, there's a distribution of talent and, you know, uh, characteristics that's universal across any population. If you get a big enough population, you're going to have the same proportion of brilliant people and idiots and the same proportion of damaged people and healthy people. And I mean, you know, it's just the, the human condition is universal and you just need a sample size big enough to be able to explore it. But I would say that the people that have created the culture being that they're mainly white and mainly male um, isn't because they, um, gamed the system or anything. It was just that opportunity was limited just to that population. So the people that were extraordinary, like, why was it limited just to that population? Because that's the way things were at the time, because there was misogyny in there. White made a system who did that. Yeah, of course they did. But the point is that, you know, you can devalue Mozart's contribution if you want, but the fact was the guy was not and he was what I'm trying to say there. And there have been plenty of white male people who are brilliant, but there's also plenty of people who aren't, who don't get the same credit. Well, they don't get the Um, same credit. And then you have people like in our society now, people like Elon Musk, who's really not that smart, not that funny. All he really has to offer is a buttload of money. Um, And yet he is what a lot of people count as extraordinary. And I think a lot of that is because he is a rich, I I would say the entirety of it is because he's a rich white man. I would would disagree with that completely saying that, yes, he has advantages and yes, he has leveraged those advantages. And yes, it's unfair that he has those advantages, but he still, there's how many other rich white guys 
haven't done what Elon Musk has done, created what three companies done? that are extreme. Well, he's created Tesla. He's created he SpaceX. He's created Tesla. boring company. He has. He's the, he's he the driving Tesla. force. He's the driving force behind the company. The same way Steve Jobs. He, he's he the driving force. Well, he, Steve Jobs actually had the patent for the iPhones. Elon Musk doesn't have a patent for anything in Tesla except for a material and a door. He didn't Fine. invent any of it. It was a company that existed that he bought. Yes. And he had the vision to see what he could create from it. And he's creating a whole ecosystem. And it's just gone downhill. Ecosystem. It's gotten he, richer, but the recalls have exploded under his leadership. And yes. the working culture from everybody who works for him has said it's gotten worse and he's segregated yes. the factories. Yes. And <laughs> he has also changed our, he has changed our society and created by Yeah. My point is more that like people like him don't, he is what we're calling extraordinary, despite not being extraordinary. Well, the I, reason I, why I, he is, why we're calling him extraordinary is because of the situation that he was in, because he's white and male. I disagree. I think you white and male. Yes, he is. And has he got advantages because of it? Absolutely. And he is taking full advantage of it. And he's not a perfect man. He's an asshole, frankly. Oops, that's a buck for you. But yeah. the, uh, but the uh, but the fact of the matter is he has changed our culture. He has changed our society because of the vision that he that he, uh, so. he that I don't he think he's has done much. But that's a longer he's conversation. Got the, the whole electric, I mean, the whole electric, not just electric vehicles, but the whole infrastructure thing that he's doing. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, I, it's not even it's not he's just bankrolling it. He's not designing these products. He's not no. hiring people. He's he not. has hiring managers who do that for him, and he has designers and scientists who build yes. it for him, and he. He yes. has marketing people and he has urban developers who are putting all of this into places. He's not behind anything that's exciting that's coming out of this. His money is. He is the vision. He's the guy who's making it all happen at the top. There is there is skill and there is talent in organizing and it's building not, companies and, and putting those people in a place. I don't respect business to chops the way that you do. I understand. I understand you don't see it, but I, and I'm disagreeing with you. I think there's a, there is a, there is a value at being a leader and a visionary and putting together a company that can achieve. I don't think he is a visionary. Well, I, I know you don't. I'm just disagreeing with you. I think yeah. you're, 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 you hate the guy and I get it because he's a jerk, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, I think if, if you look and at I it and look at the impact he's had or the companies that he is, he's, he is created have had, I, it's, it's, my it's impressive. Have you looked into the companies more than just the press releases? Have you looked into the recall amounts and the profit reports? Sure. Yes. Well, yeah. no, I haven't. I mean, I, I've been aware of him because I read the articles that come okay, out. Okay, because I out. have. I well, and, and you're he's also, not doing much. You're well, I, yeah. I mean, the, the the sources you're reading aren't giving him. Uh, they're he's they're they're giving him zero credit for. Sorry, when did I say what sources I read? It doesn't matter. I mean, the fact of the matter is that you're you've got an opinion that is based in. It's based in facts. It's based it in is. what it is. I what he's done and what he has to offer. And I think there are people with much more vision and who are way smarter than him, who are people of color who didn't own a segregated apartheid emerald mine in South Africa, who could have done so much more with what the opportunities he's been given. I think that he gets way too much credit for stuff he doesn't deserve. But I get that. We're getting off topic here, you. and I'm going to get mad at you. So I don't want to keep going down this. Uh, yeah, I just we just disagree with this uh, in, in um, terms of viewing how leaders of companies how valuable they are to the company. Rolling back. Yes. <laughs> rolling back to death and dying. Yes. The big deal is that. The big deal to me about death and dying is that it makes everything else meaningful, and death and dying is what makes my little life matter to me. Well, you, yes, you have a limited amount of time. There is another book, uh, oh, shoot, I can't remember it. Uh, your Aunt Laura gave it to me for Christmas and it was a, it was a brilliant book because, oh, uh, oh, shoot, Mortal, Mortal, The Mortal, The Immortal. I think it was called The Immortal. Immortal. No, no, that's a Tool <laughs> Gawande's book, which is also very powerful. And I did want to talk about that, but uh, I think it's, I think the name of the book is The Immortal, it's fiction in a novel about um, somebody figures out there's a, an aging gene and they can turn it off. And so everybody is the age they are when that gene gets turned off and they never die unless it's by accident or illness. Uh -huh. And um, what it means is now that all, I mean, it was, it was a brilliant imaginative view of what would happen if you didn't die. Mm -hmm. And, you know, marriages that would normally last 40 to 50 years now are, indefinite and so people after 
you started to make contracts, well, we'll be married for 30 years and then we'll go our own way because after, you know, it just becomes very boring and it's the That's same enough. thing <laughs> over and over again. And, and it just becomes less, you know, yeah. there's just nothing, no real reason to, um, you know, stay connected. And, and so the, the marriage thing was interesting. The job thing, if, if That's nobody died, things. nobody needed to retire. And that was the other thing. If you had to continue to work because you had to support yourself. So yeah. you couldn't retire. You had to continue. Oh. to work. So you would Ooh. work. Yeah. Immortality under capitalism sounds like misery. Well, it's just, it's not just capitalism. And then you had, then you had in this book, they called the Russians, maybe appropriately, started <laughs> creating armies of people, right? They would, they would start breeding people, breeding men, you know, they, they would, they would get, you know, try to encourage people, you know, couples to get pregnant. Cause of course you can still do that. If your body doesn't age, you can, you've got all these women in prime childbearing years and they start having children. And then after 18 years, you give the guys their turn off the gene. So they're always 18 and you create these armies and they start, you know, invading other countries and trying to militarily dominate by using anyway it was a brilliant brilliant book i think it's called the yeah. immortal and uh and it oh. really just kind of laid laid out what you said when with without death kind of looming over everything in your life um the motivation for doing anything goes a, a lot of the motivation goes away because there'll always be tomorrow that's why um there's really two opinions of mortality when it comes to like a lot of pop media um which I find very interesting because I definitely agree with one of them more than the other but there's the one in like Twilight where the goal of the novel is Bella wants to be immortal so she can spend forever with Edward and the idea is like immortality is a good thing that you want you don't want to die and then there's another type of media where immortality is a curse it's bad you don't want it and so you have books like The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue um, which I loved and it talks about like hers is immortality with a condition and her condition is that no one remembers her. Um, so that's rough, but there's also an anime that I really like called Demon Slayer. Um, and especially in season two, they really touch on the fact that like the demons are immortal and humans are not. Um, and because of that, that's what makes the demons evil is because what does it matter? Humans are worthless. Mm -hmm. They die. They're so fragile. Um, and the point that the main character always counters back with is like, that's what makes humanity beautiful. That's what makes it beautiful to be human is that we are fragile and we could die from anything at any time. Part mm -hmm. of why I hate driving, <laughs> but um, I definitely fall more in that opinion based on everything I've said here today. But I remember the, I read Twilight probably before I had really interacted with a lot of like immortality um, as a bad thing. And I was like, of course you want to live forever because I was in middle school and was like, life just gets better. Mm -hmm. um, and now I'm thinking, now that I've gotten older and watched more things about immortality being a, court, a curse and consumed more about that and about the meaningfulness of death and life, it's kind of like, I don't think I would take it if it was offered to me. Um, or I would, my ideal would be like the good place thing where you get as long as you like and then you can leave. Yeah. Um, and that is, if I had a choice in it, that would make everything lovely. But the fact that we don't have a choice in when we die is also kind of what adds meaning to it, because there yeah. might not be tomorrow. You don't know if there's tomorrow. Right. It's uncertain. And that's, uh, well, I, I'd recommend the book, The Immortal, just be, I'll, I'll get the real name. I believe that's what it's called. Yeah, for because, sure. No, uh, I really want to read that. I think you would enjoy it because people do start opting out. It's kind of like, uh, this sucks. Yeah, <laughs> I, you it's know, I have enough. to, I have to work all the time. It's the same thing. There's no, there's no reason for me to, to do this thing because I'll have the, I have the, I have all of eternity to do this thing. So there, there the motivation goes away. Also a book, it's a nonfiction book. It's called um, the closest thing to life. And it talks about art is the focus um, about how there's no way to conceptualize life because we're always living it. Um, and there's no way to really experience other people's lives. So art is the closest thing to life. It's the best we get to having a different life that's not ours. Um, yeah. And I just, I can't imagine if I was immortal that I would still have the same drive to create art that I do because it's about creating something that reflects life and reflects your state and your experience of life. And if your experience of life is just that it's always there, it's always given, yeah. why would you want to reflect it? Um, you know, I don't, 
want to paint like I don't know is anything in life always given I guess <laughs> well that's, that's the reason the subject matter that I like the most like plants and organic things is their fleeting nature is what makes it beautiful to me yeah well yeah and, and re, you know it's not going to be recreated but this you know the yeah I, you know I agree that the the motivation for me it's just it makes sense that if you can do it tomorrow I mean, I'm a procrastinator by nature. I mean, why would you do anything today? <laughs> you know, why don't I enjoy yeah. what I want to do in the moment instead of today? Because I'll, I'll, there's always tomorrow to do whatever I need to do. Um, mm -hmm. There is no reason to uh, to create or to do anything um, if you can do it tomorrow. And if there's always a tomorrow, then yeah, a lot of it, yeah. a lot of that motivation. The whole phrase, away. if not me, then who? If not today then when not kind now of, then when all yeah. meaning. <laughs> it does uh, it when does. you add immortality to the picture because if not now i sometime i guess i can do it tomorrow yeah yeah instead of of course now yeah. like i think the urgency is really what makes humans interesting and yes. it's very funny because that was like it that's a philosophical concept that was not put into words until later um in terms of human history and i think that we're always it's always been a center of human philosophies death and life and what gives it meaning um but one of the most casual references to how death gives life meaning i think is in the D, D player's handbook where nobody wants to play as humans because like it's a role-playing game why would i role play as a human but humans get the most stat boosts and are the best race to play as because they have short lifespans. This is what it yeah. says in the player's handbook is like humans are driven by their short lifespan to be heroic. Yeah. So they get all these boosts for it. And I'm like, that is probably the most casual reference to how meaningful life is I've ever seen is just like, yeah, you get a plus one to all your stats. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, we've talked a lot about death and, and, and as particularly as it relates to young people, because of course you're young and I was young once and, and we, you know, there's a lot of that angst and anxiety and everything that we feel, but as you get older, and this is the book Being Mortal by Atul Gawande is a, is a brilliant book, really read it. It's a one, you know, it's part autobiography, part, you know, um, you know, personal tale of, of aging um, in his families. Um, it's part sort of history of why we are where we are as we get into aging care. Um, and it's part sort of what do we do now? Um, and essentially the, the thing is, look, end of life looks different for everybody. And we've been treating it as if it were the same. Mm -hmm. And we've just kind of reduced it to the lowest common denominator. And, and, and how do you make end of life an individualized experience? Um, you know, we're all gonna fail. We're gonna fail in different ways though. And we need to have different solutions for the people, you know, as they fail in different ways that need to be more customized, more individualized. And it's a, a brilliant book. It's also a, a, a very emotional book. Um, but one of the things that they talk about in, um, in the book is as, you know, we, we typically live an expansionary life, an expansive life. We want to, we explore, right? We want to see more things. We want to travel and see, see different different places. We want to have different experiences. We want to take different classes so that we can be exposed to, to different ideas and different, um, you know, different, they're just different, different things in our lives. And uh, when we have a, 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 an expiration date, when you're diagnosed with something that says, okay, you have three months to live, um, mm -hmm. we go from an expansive life to a, a, a reductive life where you, where you eliminate the things that don't matter and you focus on the things that do. And typically those are relationships. Typically people who are facing death go, go, to, their, go to their people because that's, that's what they enjoy most. And when you don't have that certain date, um, you're free to explore. But when you only have a certain amount of time left, you wanna make every minute count. And you're going well, to make everything to... count by by mm -hmm. by you by doing the things you like to do, and typically we like to spend time with the people who matter to us. There was a funny joke, um, possibly one of the only funny moments in the movie "Don't Look Up," because um, that one's a rough one. I was yeah. like, "Oh, this will be funny," and then I watched it and was like, oh, <laughs> "Yeah, okay." Um, kind of went into a depressive spiral after that one, <laughs> but. Uh, one of the moments, and it's just a flippant joke right before the end of the movie when 
Jonah Hill's character is like, you know, if this doesn't work, I want to say goodbye to all the stuff. I think there's a lot of cool stuff that we've done. And it's presented as like a ha ha, yeah. this dummy. Um, and I think that's like, I feel like humans often don't give ourselves enough credit for being as social as we are and as like needing to have community as we are. Um, and I, I like when I see like little references like that, that are like tiny in a massive, in a major motion picture being like, isn't it silly that he thinks that stuff is what makes life meaningful when it's people like the most beautiful part of being human is getting to interact with all the other living things that are fleeting. Like I love my plants and my cats and all of the people in my life because what, by, by what crazy circumstances are we all here at the same time? Um, and it's very beautiful that we get to experience that all together. But death is the thing that makes that meaningful. That's otherwise we'd all be here always at the same time if death yeah. didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. No, the expiration date means well, and you can see it in your grandparents. Um, you know, you and Papa are traveling tremendously. This COVID COVID pandemic has been rarely tough on them because, well, you know, my friend Jim Murkowski, his uh, parents went through the independent living, assisted living, and ultimately nursing care for his mom. And in that community, they talk about the go-go years, the slow-go years, and the no-go years. And as you get closer to the end of your life, the go-go years, the, the, and, and basically the go-go years are when you're, you, you, you're not constrained. You can go places because you have your health, and you have your mobility, and you have, you know, everything you need to be able to to, to go places and do things. The slow go years means you can still do some things, but maybe you need a walker. Maybe there's, you know, maybe you can't see as well. And so, you know, you can still do things, but it's, it's, it's constrained. And of course the no go years are really the, when you're confined, when you really can't, you're not able to leave your apartment or leave your bed or, or leave your, your, your local neighborhood because you just don't have the, you just can't for whatever reason, either because you're senile or you can't, you know, you, you can't, you know, going outside scares you or you're just, you're in a wheelchair or something where you can't, you can't really, you, you just so can't. my life can't now. Well, no, you, yeah, I mean, yes. I, I mean, mean, I know you're joking, but, but you know, the, the point is at the I'm end of your life. I'm not joking. I am like making a, it's a dark joke in the fact that this is what my life is right now and it sucks. Well, yeah, but you have the you have the promise of a you know, of a different reality, or at least you have the opportunity for a different reality. I mean, when you're not when you're bed bound, when you're when you're when you're so consumed by arthritis, like Jim's mother was, that she'll never get out of bed. Yeah, that's permanent. She's that that's she's going to die in her bed, and she did right. because she can't get out, and yeah. uh, that is a, uh, you know, so, you know, kind of back to your grandparents, you know, they're, they're in their go-go years, they're in their mid to late eighties and uh, they don't have an unlimited amount of years left where they're going to be able to tour the world and see the things that they want to see because the slow go years are looming and they're looming large. And it's big part of their consciousness right now is there are things we need to see things we want to see. And we, you know, we need to do it now because, you know, tomorrow is not promised to any of us, but it's, they feel it a lot more than you and I do right it's, now. Yeah, and, they um, have a lot fewer tomorrows. If they have many goes fewer according tomorrow. to plan, they yeah. have fewer tomorrows than the rest of us have. Because that's exactly. really the big thing, too, is like all of us have just as many tomorrows as anybody else, because anything could get all of any of us at any time. There are I watched a really interesting video. Um, it's called How to Be Hopeless by Carlos Maza, who is a wonderful communist YouTube creator. Um, really fascinating stuff if you're interested in communism and the mm. theory behind it um, and why young people are drawn to it right now. Um, and you know, he talks always, they've always in that been video. Drawn to it, but... What? So they've always been drawn to it. Young people have always been drawn to communism. I wonder why that is. Um, but he talks in this video a lot about ego death and realizing and the book the plague by albert camus um and realizing that like when you're younger you kind of have this center of the universe view of yourself like it our country went through it as a whole with the covid pandemic of like mm -hmm. oh we don't need to shut down and you can really see it now if we don't need to shut down because only the disabled people are going to die only high risk people are going to die mm -hmm. um, they don't even say disabled they say high risk mm -hmm. because high risk means a huge population of people mm -hmm. um but if they say a huge population of people is gonna die you know 
there's money interests and everything going on, but it's really hard to believe when you haven't had any experiences of your own mortality that when you get in the car, you are taking your life in your hands mm -hmm. because yeah. you are, you could be the person who's killed by a drunk driver. There's thousands mm -hmm. every year. 60,000 uh, people die in car accidents every year. And it's horrible, but mm -hmm. we never think that when we get behind the car, that's not what your thought when you get behind the wheel of a car is. Your thought is, oh God, I'm running late. How am I going to get to my doctor's appointment? I should call them from the road. I'm going to change the song. You're not thinking I could die right now. I could be the person who dies. Mm -hmm. um, and now I am because I had a pretty serious car accident earlier this year. Um, so every time I get in my car, that is my thought the whole time. <laughs> makes it really hard to drive. It does. <laughs> um, but that is, that is one of the more I see it a lot more in communist and anarchist literature recognized that humans are fickle um, and life is not guaranteed less than I do in capitalist literature um, or fascist literature even, that it's very much focused on the ego of like, your life is going to play out this way instead of your life could end whenever because all of us are just as susceptible to these things as everybody else we are i'm just as likely to be in a random accident right now as you are mm -hmm. i i don't know it could rain coconuts on my house right now and i could die just yeah i mean that's like that. uh <laughs> yeah and i and i don't know how healthy it is to live like that though i mean feeling like you're always Not, at risk i mean one people um, are really there's kind bad. of a beautiful thing that comes from it though and that's that's the end of this video of how to be hopeless is that once you realize that your country is just as susceptible to fascism is really the principle of the video is American fascism. Um, once you realize that your country is just as susceptible to fascism, that you are just as susceptible to getting hit by a drunk driver as the family down the road is, mm -hmm. you kind of start to realize how beautiful everything in life is, how beautiful it is when you look out your window and the tree moves. Like when I I did shrooms recently and I made friends with the wind. So that was a weird experience. But now every time I go outside and the wind is blowing, it feels kind of like a hug. And it's that moment of like, how beautiful is it that I'm alive right now to experience the grass looking like this and the trees looking like that. And my cat being that adorable and my boyfriend hugging me. It's like, it makes, once you realize how close your own mortality is at any given moment, it makes everything else more beautiful and more powerful. And that's kind of the side to lean into rather than the terror of anything could happen instead embrace anything can happen. So everything is worthwhile. And that's yeah. really, that's made my life a lot more powerful. That video really changed some things for me in terms of how the world is going right now um, and how to experience it still in a positive way. Well, I think anything that can help you appreciate your, your circumstance. And, and we, we all have things that we should feel a lot more grateful for than we do. We take an awful lot for granted. And I think that's human nature. And it is definitely human nature to, um, we're, we're terrible at assessing risk, because you're right. I mean, we go out in a car every day. But the also, yeah. it's also true that given the amount of car trips that we have, very few of them end in death. Um, yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's not unrealistic to expect that you'll survive a car trip. Um, no, but it's also like most people do it is almost all the time. That you could not. Um, it's the same case, thing with COVID. Like I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not saying that there isn't risk. And and no, this is I'm, the thing I'm, for me that that I think, as I said, people are terrible at assessing risk. We really just scientific studies, you know, sociological studies, time after psychological studies, time after time after time shows that we're terrible at assessing and assessing risk. Because we we tend to think that I mean I, I saw a uh, I saw a uh, an article many years ago that talked about work and said how many people when they asked the question how many people will miss you know six months of work during their career you know the average answer was you know fifteen percent or something like that well the ra the reality is that you know, over a forty year career fifty percent of us are going to miss yeah. six months of work in a row. Um, you know, a big chunk of time, we'll have a serious illness or something in our life that, that changes it. Half of us will go through something like that. And uh, anyway, it's just an example of how badly we think about it. But I think once you accept that life is risky, that, that everything you do could end badly, um, that there's random things that happen, um, you know, we make it worse or better by our own behaviors, but you can never eliminate risk entirely. And once you accept that that's 
that that's the way it is, uh, that frees you up to appreciate your life a lot more and to live not in fear, um, but recognizing that it's a, everything's kind of a calculated risk that you're, you're, you're going to get in a car and drive because the benefit far outweighs the risk, which is not to say there's no risk, but that's you why know, I drive less now. <laughs> sure. Of course. And that's, and that's a great thing for the environment. It's a great thing for a lot of reasons, but the fact of the matter is you still need to get groceries and you probably have to drive yeah. to get them. Yeah. And so, you know, you make no, but the there's definitely that like when I'm sitting at home and I'm like, Oh, I'm out of my favorite snack, but that's the one thing I could go to the grocery store or I could not. And I could do something else that I enjoy and eat a different snack today. It's like, that's the moment where yeah. maybe before I had a run in with my own mortality in the car, uh, yeah. I might've been like, ah, sure. What's the harm. But now it's right. kind of like the harm is losing everything well, that matters. Potentially. I mean, yeah. again, very low probability, but you know what the impact, I mean, rate times volume matters a lot. <laughs> and yeah. uh, you know, uh, the volume part is going to be low, but the, the rate part is very, it's very the, high. It's the it, risk assessment of uh, severity versus... Yeah, um, the rate in this case is severity of the, of the incident. If it happens, the volume could be very low, but if the impact is enormous. Your mother and I had this discussion when you guys were young, and I was the advocate of letting you guys have more freedom to walk mm -hmm. down to the park on your own. Um, you know, you were six, seven, eight years old. It was, you know, you're the, the parks a block away. It was kind of like, you know, let them go. And she was like, no, no, I, I, I will go with them. And her perspective was, it's unlikely that you had been kidnapped, but if you were, it would have been so devastating that uh, she wouldn't have been able to survive it. Um, my thing was highly unlikely you're going to be kidnapped. And by protecting you so much in kind of this helicopter parent way, um, you're undermining their self-confidence and undermining their independence. And so to me, it was worth the risk to let you walk down to the park so that you could have a sense of independence. Um, but she overruled me because that severity thing was so, would have been so devastating to her. Mm -hmm. uh, it would have been to me too, but, uh, but, but to me, the, 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 the volume, the, the chance of it happening was so low. Whereas by not letting you do it, we were pretty much locking in, um, you know, that lack of independence or the lack of opportunity to practice independence. Um, and so those are the trade-offs we all have to make in our lives. And, uh, you know, as we get closer to death, um, you know, you know, we want to, we want to stack, we're willing, I think, to take maybe more risks to, to accomplish those things we wanted, uh, we wanted uh, to, to accomplish before we no longer have the opportunity to do it. And that's mm -hmm. that, you know, there'll, there'll come a time when your grandparents won't be able to travel. And, you know, they'll be ready for it when it, well, maybe they'll be ready for it. Maybe they won't. Uh, <laughs> maybe they'll they resent it. Maybe it. they won't, but they'll have to accept it or, or not, I suppose. But, um, you know, the fact of the matter is that, that, you know, because, and this gets back to your point about there is an endpoint and the looming endpoint makes things much more urgent for us and therefore makes them more important to us mm -hmm. and actually drives a lot of our choice. I mean, one of the things that I'm going to be doing here in the next several months is devote a lot more of my time and energy to writing because that's something I've always wanted to do and yeah. recognizing that uh, I'm not always going to be, I mean, I, this is a time for me to see if I, you know, what I can do with that, um, devote some, some focused attention and resources and energy. And even if it. you don't become, you know, the next great American author, yeah. you did it for you and you know that you wrote. And well, you and that's the thing that is that your life I, was spent doing what you uh, knew what your contribution was well and it's well I, I think that's a lovely idea well i think it is uh you know my contribution and again yeah i don't know if i'm going to be successful or not but the and success means you know i'll write and i'll write my thing now whether that has an impact in the world or not i don't know and whether i can afford to do that for the rest of my life i don't know either but i'm going to try and if i fail then i can at least go you know at the end of my life without without the regret um, yeah. And I think that's an important part. And maybe this is where we end it is that, yeah. you know, we don't want to leave this earth with regrets. And mm -hmm. that fundamentally, to me, is the big deal about death and dying is death and dying ends your life. And mm -hmm. if you haven't been intentional about your life, if you haven't st strove, striven, strived <laughs> for the thing, <laughs> I'm not sure what the past tense of strive <laughs> is, but uh, if you have not um, tried to, um, 
you know, to do the things that are important to you individually, um, you may not, you know, at the end of your life, you can sit there and go, geez, uh, you, you'll feel regret. And that's a terrible place to be, I think. And because we don't know when the end is coming, it's really important to think about what it is that you want your life to look like, even when you're a young person. I mean, that's, I mean, it's the same thing for me. The big deal for me about death and dying is that it gives everything else meaning. It um, does. And I've had to confront my mortality in a way that a lot of other people my age haven't. Right. Um, and I think that's, I often get told that I'm wise for my years and stuff like that. And I don't really buy into the old soul thing, but I think it's because I've had to encounter these things and being disabled at a young age really changes your perspective on yeah. what it means to have a meaningful life. Yeah. Um, and I try to live every day and do the things that I do in a way that if I died today, I wouldn't regret it. I wouldn't be like, dang, I should have done this. Yeah. Um, and like, it does, that's not to say I don't have regrets because there's always times where you have choices and you make the wrong one when you, you make the on. Yeah. You make a choice but that turns out badly. What I know that I've done and how I've lived my life is that I've loved wholly and I've given people chances and I've made art and I've let myself be creative. Um, and I've also taken time off. I've taken time to play video games that I really like, and I've taken time to watch TV. Um, and all of that, I, I'd say that if I were to die tomorrow, it would be a tragedy and like, I would be sad as it's happening um not as sad as i would be but uh, yeah yes. i'm i'm not gonna die tomorrow on purpose <laughs> put it that way yeah no well, that's on it wood. i mean you, you, it's funny but hearing you I talk about be, this you're not even 24 yet you have yeah. so much life yet to live and if I, and, and all probability so i want to do but it yeah. would be at a point where i would if i died tomorrow i would not feel like i failed i would not feel like oh my god i should have done more i would feel like wow it is a shame that i don't get the chance to continue doing what i'm doing yeah um, but I'm, and when I made the decision to start living my life as if that's going to happen, and it's very cheesy and cliche, that was really when everything became meaningful. And when I started not spending time with people who make me feel not like myself and started doing things like making art and stopped working in a job that was becoming the center of my universe, because I don't want a job to be the center of my universe. I want my life to be the center of my universe my passions to be the center of my universe. So I've, I've worked my life around that. So it is, um, and that's been lovely. That's, that's been really worth it. And that weirdly enough, the big deal about death and dying, is not about death, but about life. <laughs> well, that's fundamentally right. I mean, we yeah. talked at the beginning about the transition. This is unique in the transition and that you don't deal with the aftermath. <laughs> you only deal with what comes before the transition. And you're right. The, the way you, and I, and I agree with you, the way you, mitigate the anxiety and the stress about the end of a life is to live the life you want to live mm -hmm. and be conscious about it be intentional about it so and do the things you you want to do and don't why wait, ask don't people wait. out on dates what's that why well, ask people out on dates i don't wait for them to ask me i have asked every single boyfriend i've had out first because i don't want to just sit around and wait for someone I'm going to, yeah, that's, passive, I don't right? want to, if I were to die tomorrow, I wouldn't want to wonder what would have happened if I had asked Eric out on a date or not. Yeah. I have the answer to that. And it's that we live together and have a wonderful supportive life together. Well, your mother asked me out too. And we had 32 years together and we're now separating, but they, uh, you know, that the point and is I've, that you don't, yeah. you, you don't know what's ahead. Um, mm -hmm. Life will make, you know, the, well, you, you, you know, things evolve and everything, but don't, you know, that, that gets back to sort of live intentionally, right? Be yes. intentional about what you want to do. Ultimately, it. shockingly, the season finale of Awkward Family Conversations season four is the big deal is to live intentionally. Live intentionally, right. Death matters because you don't know when you're going to die. So don't, you know, do the things that are important to you, you know, lay yeah. the foundation for your future life. Assume that you'll still be here tomorrow, but don't, don't don't take it for granted Live as if, if you will. will but don't bank on it basically don't bank on it right i mean so yeah don't don't sacrifice everything today um for some future point but by the same token you need to lay you need to lay the groundwork and play you know play the odds the odds are that we will be here tomorrow you and i both that's why but there is like a there is a chance that we won't but, what's that um that's why i don't like hustle culture but that's a whole other thing yeah. um but it, it does come back to the do it today don't wait well, um, in a sense yeah i mean you want to be again you you don't want to in, in endurance sports there's the 
the maxim don't 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 jeopardize tomorrow's workout <laughs> and so get your workout in today do the thing that you need to do today but don't don't push so hard you've got nothing left for tomorrow i mean and i'd say the same thing i mean life is short but long and um you know the thing is that yeah live today in the moment but recognize that there's tomorrow as well so don't do anything to screw up tomorrow but if there that's your only constraint <laughs> what's that I said there might not be next week. Well, it, you know, at some point there's, yeah, I mean, yeah. was it you and I that were talking about uh, American Beauty where uh, yes. there's only one, there's one day in your life that's the last day where there's only one day in your life where there's not a tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so you have to live as if there's a tomorrow because almost certainly there will be, almost certainly there will be. But at the same token, you know, don't, don't make it all about tomorrow don't make the the biggest thing that i have is like the thing that makes me the saddest for other people is when they do things like uh instead of like you can live as if there's a tomorrow but i see people being like oh you should work like 80 hour weeks through your 20s so you can enjoy your 30s and it's like well your 30s aren't guaranteed right. like enjoy your 20s too well that's the striking the balance and a lot of people it's important for them to achieve a certain level of responsibility and i mean because and if that's what brings you satisfaction right. if in your 20s you are yeah. like i am living how i want to live then yeah. awesome yeah. do it i agree but don't torture yourself for the promise of something in years yeah. when you don't even know if you'll make it well um, that, but yeah. now we're going in circles so <laughs> you yeah. probably oh, wrap that's, up that's fair. Say, that's fair but yes the big deal about up. death and dying is to be intentional <laughs> Well, be intentional with how you live because the living, you're right. The whole thing about death and dying, it puts the, the exclamation point or the end point, the period, as it were, on your life. And you don't know when that period is coming. So, you know, try to balance the future against the present and, um, mm -hmm. you know, live the life you want to live and, and be aware of what you, what you want to do with your life um, and then try to make it happen for you. So anyway, uh, not a lot of uh, groundbreaking stuff here from us today, but uh, yeah. uh, a great conversation. Nonetheless. So that's our season four transitions uh, wrap up. It is. So yeah. take us home and uh, we'll talk about season five. Uh, well, hold on. I can't take us home yet because A, we do have an item that needs to be researched and it is the past tense of strive or the past <laughs> participle of strive. Right. Um, and B, I think you owe me a dollar. I do. I owe you a dollar. And I'm going to take care of that right now. Yes. Yes, you are. <laughs> the only thing Elon Musk has ever given me. <laughs> A dollar from my dad. <laughs> there it is. Uh, but in the it's meantime, good. while you're dealing with that, nice. Just got it. Um, we are looking for themes on season five. So let us know what you'd like to hear. Please don't ask about the workplace. I'm so tired of talking about work. Um, but I really enjoyed this season. I really liked talking about life's milestones and the uh, less formulaic, more organic flow was really, I enjoyed this. I hope that our listeners did too, all three of you. 14, 14 uh, according to our last uh, show. Hey, it turns out Bryn Mawr reunion. Bryn Mawr alumni. Yeah. Shout are, out to the Bryn Mawr. The yeah, Mars. shout out to Bryn Mawr. You yeah. guys are the Bryn Market. Um, you guys are awesome. We, Rhett does great with mid 20s lesbians. So yeah. <laughs> that's his Twitter following. Uh, but in the meantime, you can find us on Awkward Family Conversations on Twitter at Awkward Family C1, on YouTube at Awkward Family Conversations to see our backlog of all the videos with special clips of the audio intern cats yes. videos we had we had uh, some that made an appearance today so you know. yes we had one little missy come in today she's been like throwing stuff around the room too she's been she's been annoying hmm. um and you can also find us on facebook where we post a lot of the articles we haven't re referenced a whole lot this season because there's been less research <laughs> um but if you want to listen to our three other seasons and the rest of this season as well. You can find us on Stitcher, Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts, wherever really you like to listen. Um, our little our little service dude puts it out everywhere that they can. Um, so we will see you 
in a couple months, well, Who's a few to weeks say? maybe. Yeah. Whenever we figure it out, <laughs> when, we fi- when we figure out season five theme, yes, we'll uh, we'll, we'll be see back. you when inspiration strikes. <laughs> there you go. That's better. All right. I love you, Ed. I see love you next you, season. Dad. All right. Yeah. <laughs>